let's say you're busy working on a Rails application but it's starting to feel a little slow and you want to optimize the performance. But before doing that, it's best to run some kind of profiling tool so you can find where the bottlenecks are. Now there are many profiling tools available, but in this episode I want to cover Mini Profiler. This was originally created for .NET development, but has recently been ported to Ruby, and it's a really great way to profile Rails applications. Adding this is very easy. Just go into your gem file for the Rails app and add the rack-mini-profiler gem, and then run the bundle command to install it. And then after restarting the Rails app and reloading the page, you can see that Mini Profiler is automatically enabled here in development mode because it reports the time the page took to load in milliseconds on the top left here. And then clicking on this will give us a more detailed breakdown of how much time was spent in each part of our Rails application. You can see the executing of the index action in the controller only took 2 milliseconds, but rendering the product's index action took a whopping 73 milliseconds, most likely because five SQL queries were performed there because of lazy loading. And you can see that the layout itself only took four milliseconds. Now I can actually click on this five SQL link and it will tell us exactly what SQL queries were performed and the stack trace for each one of them. So this is really handy so we can see that an actual full select query is being performed here, fetching all the contents for the tasks for a given project. However, if I check out the actual page again, you can see that we're only displaying the number of tasks for a project, so there's a lot of extra data that we're fetching from the database. Now if you take a look at the index template which was being rendered, you can see this is where I'm displaying the number of tasks, and right now it's calling project.tasks.length, which is not a very efficient way to grab the count because it's going to actually fetch all of the task data from the database. Instead I can just call tasks.size, which will be much more efficient in just doing a count query on the database. So now going back to my application, when I reload the page, the number is much smaller because this time it's not actually fetching all the data from the database. You can see if I check out the SQL queries, it's just performing a count on the tasks instead of fetching all the tasks data. Now notice I'm still performing five SQL queries here and this number will only go up as we add more products. So is there a way to get this down to just one query? There certainly is, but it requires that we dive into some SQL. So I'm going to do this inside of the projects controller index action, which is just fetching products sorted by the creation date, but you'd probably want to move this query into the model because it is fairly complex. First of all, we need to fetch more than just the projects columns. We also need to fetch the count for the tasks, and I'm going to call that column uh, tasks count, which is an important name because the tasks.size call we'll end up using this value instead of having to perform a second query. Next, we need to join the tasks association, but joining in this way isn't really the best idea because Rails does an inner join by default, which won't pick up projects which don't have any tasks associated with it. So instead, I'm going to provide some SQL query here to do a left outer join, and that way I can join the tasks on the project ID column, which matches the projects.id column. Then I also need to group by the project's ID. All right, so this query isn't the prettiest thing, but let's see how it performs. So when I reload the page, and we did shave a few milliseconds off the time. And when I click on this, you can see we're down to one SQL query, and this is reporting the query takes about one millisecond, but it does take some additional time for active record to instantiate the objects and such. What if we want to figure out how long that takes to uh, process? Now, Mini Profiler gives us a method for measuring specific code, such as fetching these project records. Uh, to do so, we can call rack mini profiler and then call step on this and then provide a description, such as fetch projects. And then we can pass a block into here, and the time it takes to process this block will show up in the report. So we can force the loading of the projects here because right now they're lazy loaded, so they actually load it in the view. But we can say projects.all to force the actual loading of those projects. So now if I reload the page and then check out the details of this, you can see that fetch projects shows up here and tells us how long it took to execute that block. So this is really handy if you ever find yourself needing to measure something specific. Probably the next step in optimizing this query would be to add a counter cache column, but I won't be going into detail on that here. You can check out episode 23 on how to do that. Now so far I've been doing all this profiling in the development environment, which can sometimes lead to much higher numbers than what you would normally get. So you can see if I reload this page here, it is reporting 38 milliseconds, which is much higher because it's doing some extra loading in the development environment, but otherwise the numbers are much lower. 
So if you're doing some extensive profiling and you want something that's a little more consistent, it's better to run profiling in a production environment. Unfortunately, it can be a little tricky to run your Rails application in production on your local machine. I'll walk you through the steps quickly here. First, go into your production environment config file and set the serve static assets option to true temporarily, or you might want to set up a separate staging environment like I show in episode 72. Next, run rake assets precompile to generate the assets. Then next, make sure to set up the database for the uh, production environment. And then finally, you can start up the server under the production environment. And now reloading the page, our Rails app is being served in production environment. However, you can see the mini profile disappeared because it doesn't show up by default in production. Fortunately, it can easily be enabled through a before filter. I'm going to do this inside of the application controller. Make a before filter, let's call it a mini profiler. So the nice thing about doing it this way is that you can change this behavior depending on the current user. So instead of a mini profiler method, you can call rack mini profiler and then call authorize request to make it show up. But you can change this so that it only happens if the user is an admin or whatever authorization logic you want to add here. Now keep in mind, you'll need to restart your Rails application each time you make a change in production. But once you do and reload the page, you should get the mini profiler there and then reloading the page again, the results should be more consistent. Now, once you actually deploy, this number will likely be much different because the production hardware is different. So if you want the most accurate results, it's best to profile as close as you can to the full production environment. However, either way, it's best to compare this number relatively to other numbers instead of focusing on this number itself, because if you can get this number to go down in this environment, it will likely go down in the other environments as well. All right, I want to finish up this episode by showing you a few more of Mini Profiler's features. One cool thing is how it handles redirects. So let me show you here if I edit a product and click update, it's going to give me two profile times. One is for the update action and the other is for the show action. So if there is a redirect, that's nice to know that you'll get two profile results. Another neat feature is the ability to customize Mini Profiler on a per request basis by passing in a PP query option, and you can set this to help to get a list of the different options you can pass in here. So with this, you can check out the rack environment variables, uh, configure the backtrace for the SQL results, or the sample option, which is pretty interesting. It will uh, return a call stack various times throughout your application, but it requires a stack trace gem for that. Now for some further documentation on Mini Profiler, I recommend you check out this blog post by Sam Saffron who maintains the gem. Uh, there he goes into detail on profiling an active record query, and he shows some other cool features such as specifying a method that you want to profile in an initializer file. So you could just add this line in there and provide whatever method you want to be profiled as well. Also, check out the README, which I'll link to in the show notes. There you'll find further documentation on things such as the storage engine, which defaults to a file store in a Rails application, but you might want to change this to a Redis store, especially if you have multiple servers running your Rails app. And there are other options you can pass in, such as changing the position of the profile or which corner it shows up in, and more. All in all, Mini Profiler is a great way to find the bottlenecks in your Rails application, and it's definitely worth giving it a try. In this week's pro episode, I show various ways to improve performance on the client side. Optimizing Rails will only take us so far, and there are many other factors which can play a part in making a site feel slow. There I cover various tools to determine what needs to be optimized, and even take a look at profiling JavaScript. To watch that episode, and gain access to all previous pro and revised episodes, visit railscast.com pro, and you can sign up there for just $9 per month.